We're going to be in James chapter 1 this morning if you want to turn there. Uh, while you're finding that, I want to tell you a little bit of a story uh, as you're looking for James 1. Uh, Candace shares a classroom uh, with a lady by the name of Kelly Boyd. Uh, Kelly's become good friends with our family. They've got two little girls that are right in between Draven and Talia, so the kids like to play. And uh, Kelly has a, co- or a cousin whose name is Katie Moon. Uh, you may or may not know that name. Uh, Katie is an Olympic level pole vaulter. In fact, she won the gold medal in Japan three years ago, won the silver medal this year in Paris. Um, and so one of the things that happened this year while the Olympics were going on, uh, I've never watched an entire pole vaulting event before. I don't know if you've ever done that. It's about three and a half hours. Uh, but one afternoon while I was here, I put up on the little TV next to my desk. And while I was working, I had the uh, female pole vault on the screen. because just kind of this like loose connection. I know this person. And one of the things that happens uh, that I really enjoyed about the event is I think more than any sport I've ever seen, you get the most authentic reactions. Okay, This is actually Katie falling over the bar after she made her gold medal jump in Japan. So one of the things that's cool is they're falling from like 15 or 16 feet high, which means if you know your physics, it takes anywhere between about nine tenths of a second and a second and a half, depending on how her weight and how much upward momentum they have for them to fall once they clear the bar. And in that second and a half, you get this just vivid facial reaction of agony, of anger, of frustration, and in this case, of absolute pure joy. You, this is the look of someone who knows that they've spent their whole life chasing a goal, and in a split second, they realize, I did the thing I've been working towards, and they are thrilled. Joy does not get much more pure than that. We have other things we might think of with the phrase pure joy or complete joy. You might think of that first morning when you take a beach vacation and you get up a little bit early and you walk out on the balcony and you open the the windows and you can see the sun coming up over the ocean for the first time and you can breathe in the ocean air. That's a moment of complete joy. Or maybe you think of the first time you got to hold your newborn child or your newborn grandbaby. And you've walked in, you've got this cute little thing that you think if I drop, they'll break. And you can imagine all of the memories you're going to make together and your heart is bigger than you ever imagined possible. It's a moment of pure joy. One of my favorites when I do weddings is to watch the young man standing at the steps at the end of the church aisle. And the moment when the doors at the back of the church open, he sees his bride for the very first time. And pure joy burst onto their face. We have all of these pictures. You probably have others you could add. And I keep using that phrase because we're going to read from James chapter 1, and uh, the version that we use this morning is going to use the phrase great joy. Uh, I memorized this verse out of the NIV when I was just a little tiny kid, and so I just, I, I got pure joy is the thing. I just can't say it any other way. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers. Uh, and so we're going to read that together this morning and talk about James's picture of what great joy or complete joy really looks like. This is James chapter 1, beginning in verse 2. He says, Consider it a great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials, knowing the testing of your faith produces endurance, and endurance must do its complete work so that you will be mature, not lacking anything or lacking nothing. James says, consider it pure joy, great joy, complete joy, when you face trials of many kinds. We've already talked about our images of complete joy or pure joy, winning a big event, holding your newborn baby, standing at the ocean front, standing waiting on your bride. Not many of us would say, when I face trials of many kinds, I consider that to be pure joy. I love here that James leaves it kind of vague that he says trials of various types or many types or many kinds, because that leaves room for every trial and obstacle you may face. Maybe you're facing financial difficulties and that urgency of not being able to pay bills, not knowing if you're going to have enough money to to keep up with things, of trying to find an extra job, of pinching pennies here and there, is the trial you're walking through. And if that's the case, that fits in the box of trials of many types. Maybe your trial is a is a physical suffering. 
It's an ailment that won't go away. That's not going to get better. The doctor said, there's nothing we're going to, we can do. You're just going to hurt for the rest of your life. You're just going to be sick for the rest of your life. This is just what you have to deal with right now. And your trial is that of physical pain and suffering that fits in the box of trials of various kinds. Maybe your trial is social or relational. You're grieving the loss of someone that you love. You feel like you've been betrayed by a friend that you thought you could trust. You feel all alone because there doesn't seem to be anyone who cares about you anymore. That trial fits in the box of trials of many kinds. He leaves it vague enough that whatever hard thing you're dealing with in your life today in 2024, it fits in the box. It counts as a trial of various types, a trial of many kinds. So what's weird about this passage is that he does not say, like we began with Job, he does not say, when you face trials of many kinds, be joyful anyway, because God is still good. That's true. And there are Bible passages that tell us that, including Job. But that's not what James is saying here. James says, Consider it pure joy when you face trials. He's not saying be joyful in spite of the hardship. He's not saying be joyful in spite of the obstacle you're facing. He's saying be joyful because of the obstacle you're facing. Be joyful because the trial is in your life. And that, my friends, is weird. I understand joy when you win an Olympic gold medal. That makes sense in my brain. I don't understand joy when you get a cancer diagnosis. That doesn't make sense. I understand joy when you're on vacation at the beach. I don't understand joy when you've lost your job. That seems strange to me. So there has to be a reason, a point. What is James trying to say when he says, consider it great joy, complete joy, pure joy, when you have these obstacles in your life? I think it would be helpful this morning to look at a couple of other passages together and see if we can't piece some things together. So here is how Paul puts it in Romans chapter 5. He says, not only that, but we rejoice in our afflictions. We rejoice in our hardships and sufferings because we know that affliction produces endurance. Endurance produces proven character and proven character produces hope. And this hope does not disappoint because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Here's how Peter puts it in 1 Peter chapter 1. He says, You rejoice in this, though now for a short time you had to be distressed by various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, more valuable than gold which perishes through refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what do these three passages have in common? And there are another handful we could have looked at. They all have the same basic point. Rejoice in the difficulty because of the difficulty, because it will produce in you something that is of immense value. In James, he puts it this way. When you face trials of many kinds, be joyful because we know that the testing of your faith will produce perseverance, right? This ability to finish. And First Peter, he talks about it in terms of it will produce a genuine faith that will result in your glory at the end of time, that God will be glorified by your faithfulness and you will get to be with him. And that kind of faith, he says, is more precious than gold. In Romans, he says that we know that these trials produce in us endurance, the ability to finish well, and that if we continue to follow with endurance, then we will receive character, and this character will give us hope in Jesus, and that hope will not disappoint us. The idea here is twofold. One, you need the kind of faith that is going to help you make it all the way to the finish line. I don't know how many of you were here that night, but I still have this memory of a conversation we had probably five or six years ago at Soul Food. And we were studying, we were working through the life of Paul, and we were studying 2 Timothy. And in 2 Timothy, Paul writes about, he says, I've finished the race, I've fought the good fight, I've won the prize. 
And the conversation turned to the fact that Paul does not say, I ran faster than everybody else. He does not say, I was first to cross the finish line. He does not say, look at all that I accomplished. He simply says, I finished the race. And someone in the midst of that conversation said, kind of sounds like he got a participation trophy, which, you know, has a little certain stigma in all culture that we would give a participation trophy. And I don't know whether it was my own cynicism or the Holy Spirit. We're going to go with the Holy Spirit here who put these words in my mouth. Um, I said, he, he didn't get a participation trophy. He didn't get a, he didn't get a tr- prize for participating. He got a prize for finishing. I don't know if you've ever been to a marathon or a half marathon or a road race, or maybe you've been to one of those, um, those events where they do like a 10K, but they have all these obstacles they have to climb along the way. And the guy who finishes first will throw his arms up and celebrate and they'll put a medal around their neck and he will be joyous and excited. And the guy who finishes 718th will throw his arms up and have a big smile and they'll put a medal around his neck. But you're mistaken if you think that's a participation medal because it's not. It's what they call a finisher's medal. You only get it if you finish. (laughs) And one of the attributes that is most highly praised in the New Testament over and over and over again is perseverance, endurance, the ability to make it to the finish line. Lots of people can start the journey following Jesus. Lots of people get excited about Jesus. Lots of people go, yeah, I'm in. But to have the faithful, persevering endurance to get the finisher's medal, to make it all the way to the end, that's worth having. And James and Paul and Peter, they all say the same thing. When we go through hardships and trials, they cultivate in us the strength of faith the strength of character that will allow us to make it to the finish line. Because my brain is weird, I think in weird metaphors. And so I want to show you a video clip in just a moment. Mike is going to start it for us. Um, Remember the original Karate Kid movie? Way back when with Mr. Miyagi and Daniel LaRusso. And Daniel comes to Mr. Miyagi to be trained in the art of Kung Fu. And Mr. Miyagi makes him do chores, right? He spends days like sanding the floor and wax on, wax off, right? And you paint the fence or paint the house. And there's this scene about halfway through the movie-ish where young Daniel is like, I'm done. This is stupid. I came here to learn how to fight. I came here to defend myself. I'm being bullied by all these people and all you've got is me doing chores. I'm tired of sanding your deck. I'm tired of painting your fence. I'm tired of just doing chores. If you're not going to teach me karate, I'm leaving. And in that kind of one of the climaxes of the movie, we get this particular scene. Stand the floor. Stand up. Show me sand the floor. Sand the floor. Sand the floor. Sand the floor. Big sucker. Sand the floor. Sand the floor. Now show me wax on, wax off. Hey! Wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax off. Hey, wax on, hat. Wax off. Hat. Concentrate. Look my eye. Lock the hand. Thumb inside. Wax on, hat. Wax off. Hat. Wax on, hat. Wax off, hat. Wax on. Wax off. Ush. Show me paint the fence. Up, down. Up, down. Up, down. Other side. Look, I always look, I. Show me paint the house. Side, side. Blacklist, side, 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 Ush. show me wax on, wax off. Hit! 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 Show me paint the fence. Hit! 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 Show me side to side. Hit! 
Yak! 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 You're my son of Flora. Hat! Lace! 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 Hush. So the premise of that, and I'm pretty sure that's not how you actually learn karate, um, but if you want to try it, my car needs waxed, and you can do that for a couple days and we'll see how you do. But the premise of that particular film is that all of these mundane things that he did not want to go through, that he did not want to do, that he did not enjoy, were actually training his muscles and training his body for something far greater. And the, the thrust here of James and of Peter and of Paul is this idea that when we face these difficulties, and it could be whatever you would put in that box of trials of many kinds, and you look at them and go, I don't want to go through that. I don't want to deal with that. God, can't you just take that away and make my life easier? There's actually something that's happening underneath the surface where our souls are being trained for something greater. That He is developing in us a character and a sense of perseverance and a deep, strong faith that has what it takes to help you make it to the end. And this, my friends, is a value far greater than gold. And part of the reason we don't really understand this is because we don't know what's actually good for us. If 16 years in youth ministry taught me anything, it's that as human beings, we don't actually know what's good for us. If I had a, if I, if I had a book contract, I could fill 20 volumes of times that I sat across from a 14-year-old and they said something like, do you think it would be a good idea for me to date my best friend's ex? And I would go, no, no, I don't think that's a good idea. And then about three months later, they're sitting in my office going, you're right, that was a bad idea. That did not work out well for me. And I could just fill volumes of books of kids who are like, I know what I want. I know what will make me happy. I know what is good for me. And then six, seven months later going, man, I wish I'd listened to you. And not that I'm always right, I'm just smarter than most 14 year olds, which take that for what it's worth. And what I've learned in life is most of us as grown ups, we don't actually know what's good for us either. And it has led to what I think is perhaps the most misused verse in the New Testament. It's one of my favorites, but it gets used out of context all the time. This is what Romans 8.28 says. He says, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, those who are called according to His purpose. This is a verse that is very easy to pull and use to promote like the prosperity gospel, right? If I just love and follow God, He'll give me all the good things. I'll have a big house and I'll be healthy and my family will love me and I will be happy in my life. Because we think that what is good for us is the material comfort of this world. When we define the good life, we're talking about vacations and beach homes and nice cars and big houses and lots of friends and family. That's our picture of the good life. And so when we read Romans 8, 28, we say, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God. God's going to make everything work out so that I am more comfortable and more happy. And the problem with that is we don't understand what's really good for us. That's not what that verse is about. In fact, if we read the very next verse, this is what he says in verse 29. He says, For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he, Jesus, would be the firstborn among many brothers. Paul defines what's good for you. When God says, I will work all things to the good of those who love me, what he means is, I will use every single thing in your life to conform you to the image of Jesus so that you may look like your brother, the Son of God. That's what he means when he says he'll work it for your good. He will work it so that it will conform you to God's image. I think it's worth pausing here to let you know that I, I don't think the Scriptures teach that God sends bad things into your life. I don't think you're going to find scriptural support for God giving some, some trial to you. He allows them to happen. 
We live in a broken, messed up world with cruel, unkind people where disease and death are everywhere we look. And he could stop them. But we see in the story of Job, he allows Satan to test Job. And Paul's story we read last week, Satan gives him the thorn in the flesh. God just chooses to not take it away. God allows those things. And more importantly, God uses those things to help the people who love him look more like Jesus. What's that look like tangibly? Imagine a 19 or 20 year old out on their own for the very first time, struggling financially to make ends meet, eating ramen noodles and, you know, no cable plan, no cell, you know, cheapest cell phone plan they can find, working two jobs, just struggling to make ends meet. And what if instead of viewing that as a burden, they view that as an opportunity to fight the greed and materialism that is in their heart? So someday when they're in their 40s and they have a real job and they've got more money than they need, they know how to live on a little. And they become the most generous givers you've ever met in your life because they know they don't need all the luxuries of this world because God has formed them through the trial, chipping away at their heart bit by bit so they look more like Jesus and they develop the kind of faith that helps them make it to the end. We have some folks in our church who have been playing the role of caregiver longer than I can imagine. Taking care of their moms, taking care of their spouses. They've had years upon years of being the one who's there to, to make sure they can get to the bathroom and feeding them and giving them their medicine. And they've got this person they love who's been chronically ill for a long time. And it feels like a burden. And it feels like a trial. And what we would say is, God, could you just fix this and make it more comfortable? But what God would say is, I want to use this for your good, meaning I want to mold you. I want to chip away at your pride. I want to chip away at the part of you that doesn't see the hurt of other people. And I want to teach you a level of compassion you've never known before. And someday you're going to volunteer at the hospice center. Or you're going to visit folks in the church who are sick and dying. Or you're going to take care of somebody else's sister because there's nobody there to take care of her. And you're going to develop the same compassion for the hurting that I have. And I'm going to use this season of your life that you would call a trial to mold you to look like Jesus so that you have the kind of faith that will make it all the way to the end. And we could go on and on. How the loss of a loved one gives you the ability to then comfort other people. That's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians, right? That the comfort we receive of God may overflow in us to comfort the people that are around us. That as I learn to mourn and grieve the loss of someone I love, I then can become a companion when somebody else is hurting or in need. And so these obstacles and trials, rather than view them as miserable things that we want taken away so that life would be more comfortable, James and Paul and Peter in unanimous voice say, rejoice in the trial. Praise God for the trial. Celebrate the trial because if you let him, God will use that to mature your faith so that you have what it takes to make it all the way to the finish line. And let me be honest, folks. It's the only thing that matters. I don't care how comfortable your life is. I really don't. I pray for you. I ask God to heal you. I hope that things work out. But I don't care how comfortable your life is. But I care deeply that you make it all the way to the end. I care deeply that you know Jesus and love Jesus and follow Jesus until the day you get to spend eternity with Him because that's what matters. And so when we pray for the good of others, we are not asking that God would make life easy or comfortable or anything else. We're asking God, would you shape them and mold them into the image of your Son so that one day they can live with Him for all of eternity because that's the goal. And so James says, consider it pure joy, my brothers when you face trials of many kinds. Because we know that the testing of your faith creates perseverance, and perseverance must finish its work so that you will be complete, not lacking anything. The reason there is pure joy in our trials is because they make us look like Jesus. And isn't that what we're all about? We're going to sing a song this morning that is the best song I know to talk about joy and contentment in every situation. It says, when peace like a river flows, when life is good, when life's amazing, when everything is exactly the way I would have it, it's well with my soul. I'm happy and I rejoice and I celebrate. And when sorrows like sea billows roll, 
when life is hard and difficult and challenging and not going according to my plan, even then it is well with my soul. I will rejoice in the good stuff. I will rejoice in the hard stuff because I believe God is going to use all of it to mold and shape me into the image of His Son. And so it's all good. It's all well with my soul. And in that beautiful final verse, right? Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be made sight. When all that I have done, all of the enduring, all of the following, all of the submitting, becomes realized. And I see God in all of His glory. On that day, it will truly be well with our souls. And so this morning, I encourage you to sing this with every ounce of your heart proclaiming that whatever season of life you are in right now is a reason to rejoice because God is good and God's going to use it for your good and one day He's going to bring you all the way into His house. What a glorious day that will be. If you happen to be here this morning or you happen to be watching online and you don't know Jesus that way, you don't have that kind of relationship with Him, I'd love the opportunity to have a conversation with you. And whether that means coming down front while we're singing, or that means leaving a message for us on the live stream, I would love to share the good news of what Jesus has planned for you in whatever way we need to have that conversation. For the rest of us, let this be a proclamation of our hearts as we lift our voices and lift our souls. It is well. God, we uh, praise you today. We praise you for the good stuff. We praise you for the healings and the safe trips and the good health, and the amazing friendships. And we also praise you for the hard stuff. We praise you for the hospital visits and the tests and the surgeries. We praise you in the midst of our grief. We praise you in the midst of our sorrow. We praise you that not everything works out the way we want. And God, the reason we praise you for those things is because we believe that you're going to work all of them to our good. You're going to teach us humility and service. You're going to teach us patience and kindness. You're going to teach us self-control. You're going to teach us how to serve one another. God, even the stuff that we look at and wish would go away, you can work even through that. And so we declare today that whatever season of life we're in, it's all good because you're good. It is well with our souls. God, thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.